How much time does our world have? History is littered with man's failed attempts for utopia on Earth. Kingdoms crumble and empires evaporate. What is the destiny of man? How can one find personal peace? Can we know the future? Yes, we can. Throughout the scriptures, God has sent messages of hope to help us recognize our place in time and prepare for the future. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents Millennium of Prophecy with Doug Batchelor. Good evening and welcome to another evening at Millennium of Prophecy. My name is John Lomaking and we're coming to you live from Manhattan Center in the metropolis of New York City and we are so glad that you've chosen to join us another night. Friends, we are excited about what's taking place here in New York City and as I've heard by phone and by email, many are excited around the world and we are glad that you've chosen to be a part of this extravaganza in Bible prophecy for the second evening. Tonight, we're going to encourage you to stay by, and you still have time to invite your friends, invite your neighbors, and as Pastor Bachelor said last night, invite your enemies and turn them into your friends. So we're so glad that you have chosen to be with us tonight. Before we go further in our broadcast, however, I'd like to invite you to bow your heads with me. Those of you who are in America, Europe, around the world, let's bow our heads together as we invite God's presence to be with us this evening. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the joy that comes in studying your word for this very pivotal time in history, the closing of one millennium and the beginning of another. And we invite you to be with us tonight as we unfold your word. May we be blessed by this time we spend in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Many have asked about Doug Batchelor. He's a personal friend of mine I've known for over 15 years. And when I listen to his story, I'm still reading his book for the second time. When I read this, it brings a smile and also it fills me with wonder how God can change, change a life from atheist to Christian and then to put him in the position to share this wonderful message with those of you around the world. This book may be available at your host site. Ask your hosts about that before you leave this evening. But Friends, join with me tonight as we welcome Doug Batchelor this evening. Let's welcome him right now. <laughs> Thank you, John. Welcome again, friends, to the Millennium of Prophecy. I hope you have your seat belts fastened. We have an exciting program for you tonight. And if you are going to miss a program, you should have missed some of the other ones because they just get better from this point on. We're building momentum and uh, it's going to be very, very exciting. At this point, I'd like to bring out a lady who is both a bachelor and married, my wife. So if uh, Karen could join me, we have some Bible questions that came in. We didn't get as many as we had hoped. You know, if you dial the bachelor home, you'll get the answer machine that says, you've reached the bachelor pad. <laughs> so. Uh, all right, you know, our first Bible question. The Bible starts out in Genesis with only four people. So how did the world get so populated? Okay, well, first it starts, of course, with two, Adam and Eve, and then they had two sons initially. Who remembers what their names were? Cain and Abel. And then Cain became furious with his brother because his brother's sacrifice was accepted. His wasn't. He killed his brother. Cain fled, and it says, Cain and his wife, and everybody goes, wait. Where did Mrs. Cain come from? And that's a good question. If you read a little further in the Bible, you'll find out it tells us in Genesis chapter 5, not only did Adam and Eve have Cain and Abel, it says they had other sons and daughters. Now, some people struggle with this uh, fact, but the Bible is written from a patriarchal perspective. You notice in the genealogies of Jesus that you find in Matthew chapter 1, it only mentions four women. And that's because those women play prominently other places in the Bible. Otherwise, it only talks about the fathers and the sons because it was a patriarchal society. Cain married his sister. Now, some of you are going, ooh, when you think about that. But 
technically, who did Adam marry? They both had the same parent, didn't they? And if you know your Bible, you'll know that Abraham married his half-sister, Sarah. Jacob married his cousin. Isaac married his cousin. It wasn't until you get down to the time of Moses that there was a strict edict that brothers and sisters were not to marry. The bloodline and the genes had been stretched so thin at that point that it could generate some birth defects. But when man came from the hands of the Creator, his vitality was perfect. perfect. Yeah, there was no problem. So Cain married Mrs. Cain. All right. His sister. That's right. Did God approve of polygamy? No. And some are asking that question because uh, are there people in the Bible who were godly men who had more than one wife at a time? Yes, they just didn't know better. <laughs> Did the Lord approve of that? No. no. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 17 that sometimes God winks at man's ignorance. When he knows better, he commands them to repent. Somebody came to Benjamin Franklin one time, it was a polygamist, and he said, you show me one scripture that says a man can't have more than one wife. Franklin quickly quipped back, that's easy. The Bible says no man can serve two masters. <laughs> God winked at their ignorance. They did not know. God made one wife for Adam. He did not make him a harem. One is more than most men can handle. It was That's never true. his plan for a man to have multiple wives. Look at all the heartache that were brought into the families. The multiple wives of Solomon drew away his heart after other gods. The two wives that Abraham had with Sarah and Hagar, there was strife in the household and fighting among the wives of Jacob. And there was never harmony. And so God never condoned it. Uh, God did make certain laws to protect the practice, but it didn't mean he condoned the practice. All right. Who were the two witnesses in Revelation 11, and are they symbolic? Okay, we will touch on this because we don't have a lesson that deals with it. Revelation chapter 11, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but remember Revelation, and tonight in our study, we explain some of the symbolic keys to unlocking prophecy. Revelation is written in a number of symbols. And it speaks in Revelation chapter 11 about these two witnesses. Uh, some are wondering if these two witnesses represent Moses and Elijah. How many of you have heard that before? The two witnesses are Moses, Moses and Elijah. That's not entirely wrong except to say it's not literally Moses and Elijah, but Moses in the Bible represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. If you look in Mark chapter 9, now this story I'm giving you is found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three Gospels, three of the first four. There's an experience called the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to the top of this very high mountain. They sit down to rest and catch their breath, and suddenly Christ begins to shine like the sun, the Bible tells us in the New Testament. Moses and Elijah appear, and Jesus begins talking to them. Moses represents the law, Elijah represents the prophets. You know, the last statement in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, says, remember the law of Moses, behold, I send you Elijah. Isn't that interesting? Then you turn to the New Testament, and there in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Moses and Elijah appear and endorse the ministry and the person of Christ as the Messiah. That Moses represents the law. Something else interesting, Moses died, God buried him, and he was resurrected because here he's appearing to Jesus, a miraculous resurrection. How did Elijah get to heaven? He rode a chariot. Swing down sweet chariot. He took a fiery chariot. You've heard the story up there. And so they represent all classes of people when Jesus comes back. Some will be caught up like Elijah when the Lord returns. Some are resurrected like Moses. That experience on top of the mountain was a miniature picture of the second coming. The two witnesses that you find in Revelation chapter 11, they represent the Word of God. You might say the New and the Old Testament. You might say the Law and the Prophets. The Word of God that is persecuted and rejected, and then at the end, it's exalted up to heaven. That's all I can say now because it's a whole sermon in itself. All right. When will the seven years of tribulation take place? All right. I want to ask you a question. And we might get a camera to spin around. I want to see our friends at home to see the audience response here because it'll probably be about the same across the country. How many of you have heard of the seven years of tribulation? Let me see your hands. Go hold your hands up if you've heard of that before. Okay, you all see that at home? Show me where in the Bible you find the phrase seven years of tribulation. It's not in the Bible. 
Now, the Bible does tell us there is a great time of trouble just before Jesus comes. It speaks about it in Daniel chapter 12, the first couple of verses there, Matthew chapter 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, Luke 17, talks about just before the Lord comes, there's going to be this climatic time of trouble. Matter of fact, the Lord makes us shudder because he says it'll be worse than anything that has ever happened before and there'll never be anything like it in the future. And he speaks about this very dramatic time of trouble, great tribulation. Revelation tells us that the tribulation is actually divided in a couple of segments. First, this political religious power is going to tell people they cannot buy or sell unless they capitulate their convictions and go along with the beast. When that doesn't work, there's an ultimate death decree. That great time of trouble, the time period is not given in the Bible. Some have wondered, is it three and a half years? Because there's many times in the Bible where there were three and a half years of persecution, three and a half years where there was no rain. The idea of seven years of tribulation comes from a prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, but you do not find the phrase seven years of tribulation anywhere in the Bible. All right, we need to rush to our last question. Okay. All right. Is there life on other planets? Someone's wondering, does the Bible say there's life on other planets? We have every reason to believe there is. If you read in Hebrews chapter 1, it says that God the Father through Christ made the worlds. It says in the book of Job that the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan appears coming from the earth, this heavenly meeting. We all know there's angels, there's seraphim, there's cherubim. And so is there other life? Obviously. The universe is infinite. This planet represents the one lost sheep that the shepherd came to save. The 99 that did not fall are still safe in the fold. I believe that we are quarantined from the other life forms because we have this disease of sin. Tonight we are going to lesson number two. We're so glad that you're here. Now you heard me mention before I lived on the Navajo Reservation in New Mexico two different times. Matter of fact, my uncle Harry Batchelor, who just passed away this year, operated a trading post there the better part of his life and I lived with him on the reservation. That was when I was a, a rebellious, lost teenager. God in his providence brought me back again about 10 years later to do mission work among the Navajos, and I pastored a church. And it was a real pleasure. But you know, the Navajo language is one of the most complex languages in the world. We have Navajos that are participating. I want to say yatehe to my Navajo friends in New Mexico and Arizona who are tuning in on satellite right now. Very complex language. Matter of fact, they did not even have it all in written form until 1947. And the Bible wasn't even completed until I think just in the last 20 years in Navajo. During World War II, everybody was breaking everybody else's secret code. The Allies were able to break the code machine called the Enigma that the, the Germans, the Nazis, felt like it was impossible for them to break it. But they got some very brilliant mathematicians together and they cracked the Enigma code. And the Japanese successfully broke all of the codes the Marines were using for communicating there in the South Pacific. An engineer living in New Mexico who had been raised by missionary parents among the Navajos, he approached the Marines and he said, you need to get these Navajos that speak English and their native language, give them a simple code, let them talk among themselves, it will never be understood by anybody. And he finally sold the military on this idea and it was true. It was the only code that the Japanese were not able to break. They could understand each other and they would even talk sometimes in, in uh, in comical terms, communicating top secret messages, and the officers never knew. But they'd use their own lingo, and it, because they were Navajos, and they knew how to talk to each other, they understood, but nobody else understood what they were saying. A lot of people feel like the Bible is a mystery that cannot be understood. I'm here to tell you that there are symbols in the Bible, and some are difficult, but God does want you to understand. Matter of fact, the very first words of Revelation you open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. You'll see the title of the book it says the Revelation of St. John. I'm wondering how many of you have a title in your book, Revelation chapter 1 at the top. It says the Revelation of St. John. Does it say that? Any of you? Yeah, I see some of you have that. Okay. What does the first verse of chapter 1 say? The Revelation of Jesus Christ. That's not titled correctly then, is it? 
The book is not a revelation of the Apostle John. It's a revelation of Jesus. The word revelation means a revealing. God wants us to understand the prophecies. But the secret key to unlock the prophecies of revelation are in other places of the Bible. You see, there's about 404 verses in Revelation. Out of those 404 verses, almost 278 can be found virtually word for word other places in the Bible. And so the stories of the Bible give us the symbols and the keys to unlock the code and understand the prophecies perfectly. And as we go on with our study, you'll see how true this is. Today we're going to begin with a story called The Road to Emmaus, our lesson back to Jerusalem. It's called in the Bible, The Road to Emmaus Experience. The disciples were absolutely devastated after Jesus was crucified. You see, all of their hopes had centered on him as the promised Messiah. And they, like many Jews today, and of course, I want to remind you, I am Jewish. I still claim my Jewish heritage. They believed that the Messiah was going to come and overthrow the Romans and sit on the throne of David. And when he died on a cross, they said it must not have been him. And their hopes were completely crushed. And uh, they didn't know how to deal with it. They were just completely absorbed in grief. Then things were complicated further when early Sunday morning, some of the women reported that Jesus appeared to them and that the angels had said he had risen from the dead. And to make matters worse, then the Roman soldiers went into town and said there was an earthquake and they were paid to say the body was stolen away. And here the apostles thought, we're going to be held liable for stealing his body. All these things were swimming in their minds as two of the disciples made their way that Sunday afternoon from Jerusalem, seven miles down the road to Emmaus. And we take up our story in Luke 24, 13. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus. Emmaus means hot water. Don't forget that. Which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed in reason that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. Get the message first here. They're going from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is Jerusalem. You know, in Hebrew you say shalom, means peace. City of peace, downhill to hot water. Jesus is with them, but they don't know it, and they're miserable. Now, friends, the Bible tells us eternal life comes from knowing God. A lot of people are unhappy because they don't know him. They don't know he's there. A better part of my youth, I didn't know him, and I was suicidal, miserable, looking for some purpose. Here they are going downhill. Their backs are to the city of God. They're going to hot water. Jesus is with them, but they don't know it. A lot of people in the world don't know that God's taking care of them, and they don't even believe in him. The Bible says he's not far from any one of us. A lot of people, their eyes are closed. They don't know it. And as they're walking down the road, they're talking about all the terrible events that had occurred during the weekend, how their hopes had been dashed. They thought that Jesus would have been the Messiah. And this apparent stranger joins them as they're going down the road. That was considered good manners in Bible times. <laughs> you know, walking down the streets in New York City, I've noticed that not everybody converses with one another as they go down the streets. And if you do converse too much, people get a little distance between you and them. But they were more social back then. And this stranger said, why are your communications so depressing and sad? And they said, where have you been? Haven't you heard about all the things that happened this weekend in Jerusalem? And Jesus said, what things? Now, did he know what happened that weekend? He was the focus of the whole thing. You know, God asks questions not because he does not know, but he wants us to think. Adam ran away from the Lord, and God says in the garden, Adam, where are you? Do you think the Lord really didn't know where he was? In the upper room, the disciples were arguing among themselves which was the greatest. And Jesus said, no, what were you talking about on your way to the upper room? He knew what they were talking about. God knows everything. He's God. But sometimes he wants to draw us out. Christ uses what we call the Socratic method of teaching. He uses questions to get us to think. And they said, oh, well, you haven't heard about Jesus of Nazareth, who is a prophet, mighty indeed, before God and the people, and how he is turned over by the religious leaders and crucified, and now they say he's risen from the dead, and we don't know what's become of him. And he said, oh, fools, and slow of heart to believe. And they were surprised at the audacity of this stranger. Slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Didn't you know that the Scripture said the Messiah would do this very thing? And then the Bible says, 
beginning, oh, friends, what I would not pay for an audio tape of that two-hour sermon as they walked that seven miles from Jerusalem down to Emmaus, I would give everything I own to hear Jesus go from Moses to Malachi and open up all the scriptures and show from the Old Testament that he was who he had been prophesied to be. And while he spoke, their hearts began to yearn and burn within them, and they thought, well, that's right, that's right, this makes sense. How come we didn't see that before? And then they reached the destination. And as they got to their humble cottage, Jesus made like he was going to keep on going down the road, and they said, no, no, abide with us. It's almost night. And they compelled him to stay. Incidentally, some of you know that famous hymn, Abide with me, fast falls the eventide, comes from this experience. And Jesus, when you invite him in, he'll come in. Don't forget that. When you invite him in, he'll come in. And so he came in and he sat down to break bread with him. And then the Bible tells us that in the process of breaking bread and as he offered the blessing, suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized that all this time they had been in the very presence of Jesus. And I, I imagine they threw themselves at his feet to worship him and poof, he disappeared. I always thought that was sort of a mean thing to do. They said, Jesus, and boop, he was gone. But now, notice what happens. Now, they can't see him, but they know he's alive. They are so excited, they're tired, they're hungry, they don't even eat, but now they go back up the hill to Jerusalem because they've got good news they need to share with their friends that are discouraged. You know, that's the first thing that happens is when the Holy Spirit begins to ignite your heart, you want to tell others. You want to say, come and see. I hope that you're inviting your friends to this seminar where your hearts will be set ablaze by the Word of God. Amen. So they went back to Jerusalem. And you know what? Jesus appeared in the upper room with them in Jerusalem there too. You know what that means? He was with them on the way down the hill. They saw him, but they didn't know him. He was with them on the way up. They did not see him, but he was still there nonetheless. Christ said, blessed are those who believe, what? Without seeing. That's what it means to have faith. Well, let's get into our questions for tonight. Question number one. we got a lot of material to cover, and this is a great lesson, so I need to move along. How much of the Scripture are we commanded to believe? Answer? Believe all that the prophets have spoken. And then we go to 2 Timothy 3, 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, I need to pause here and do a little visual demonstration. I have a lot of the Bible memorized. It's my favorite book. I read it first thing in the morning when I get up. When I go to sleep at night, I take Bible tapes with me on the road. And my eyes are usually tired at the end of the day, so I listen to Bible tapes as I go to sleep at night and as my wife snores. And so I know the Bible pretty well. <laughs> she admits it. It doesn't bother her. And uh, matter of fact, sometimes she wakes herself up. She goes, was I, <laughs> she says, was I snoring? <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Where was I? So you won't always see me picking up my Bible, but you're going to hear me quoting Scripture, and if you hear me quote a Scripture, write it down, and you go check on Pastor Doug on your own, okay? The Bible, as we know it, it it's a Latin word, biblios. It means the book. It is the books, the book of books, so to speak. It's divided in the New and the Old Testament. Now, when I grew up here in New York City, my father and mother divorced when I was three years old, and my father complained that I was not getting any religious instruction. My mother, who was Jewish said, uh, okay, and she sent me to synagogue. And of course, they believed in the Old Testament and uh, some of those sacred writings. Uh, when I went to live with my father, he sent me to Catholic school. They used to kind of go to each other that way. And so I've had a very well-rounded religious instruction. But I, I thought it was very interesting that, uh, you know, I studied with one group and they said, just the Old Testament. And then I went to some Protestant churches and they supplied just New Testaments in their churches. Most Protestants don't believe that, but some do. And I want you to know today, the whole thing comprises the Bible, the New and the Old Testament. You cannot understand the prophecies by throwing away the New Testament. Look here. Here's the book of Matthew. This is where the New Testament begins. This is the Old Testament. If you throw away your Old Testament, you're throwing away the, the better part of the keys that unlock the prophecies and three quarters of the Scripture. Ten percent of everything Jesus said, he's quoting the Old Testament. And keep in mind, when Christ talked about the Scripture, when Christ used the Scriptures, there was no New Testament. The New Testament is the words of Jesus and the apostles that were recorded later. So it's very important that we recognize all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and that we utilize it in our study. We're going to do that 
That's our approach during this program. Question number two. Whom did Jesus say that the scriptures and the prophecies reveal? Answer, Luke 24, verse 27. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, remember, there's no New Testament. And here he's showing from the whole Old Testament the things concerning himself. He is all through the Bible in the New and the Old Testament. The next part of that answer is John 5, 39. And it says, Search the scriptures, for they are they that testify of me. Now, you know, the stories in the Bible are all little miniature pictures of the coming Messiah. Let me give you a couple of examples. Joseph. How many brothers were there? Twelve brothers. Joseph was one of them. Just like Jacob had twelve sons, Jesus had twelve apostles. Joseph was sold for the price of a slave. They took away his clothes. They dipped it in blood. They put him in a hole where there was no water, but he came out alive. Christ was sold by Judas for the price of a slave. They took away his clothes that were splattered with his blood from a beating. Yet he still forgave those who persecuted him, and Joseph forgave his brothers who sold him. And I could take that story for the rest of the night. You've got Abraham and Isaac going up the mountain together to sacrifice the father, offering the son. For God so loved the world, he gave his son. Isaac's got the wood on his back. Jesus had the cross on his back. And finally, they find a ram with its horns caught in a thicket, a ram with a crown of thorns. There's so many parallels in the Old Testament that help us recognize when Jesus came who he was. Thousands of examples. So the scriptures testify of him. The next part of this answer is the revelation of, we've looked at this already, Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And those things are transpiring right now. The Bible is a revelation of Jesus. All right, let's go to the next question. Number three. What is another name that is used in the Bible for Jesus? Answer, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. I'm sorry, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. One of the titles for Christ is the Word. Next part of that is John 1.14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. God the Son incarnate. That means in the flesh. He took on the form of a human. Three primary reasons that Jesus came. Came to show us what the Father's like. You remember at the end of his ministry, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The world is in a great deal of darkness. There's a lot of misunderstanding about who God is. Who is the Father? A lot of people picture this big uh, policeman up in the sky with a billy club waiting to zap us when we do something wrong. Jesus came to show us that the Father loves us. He came to demonstrate and reveal the Father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Second reason Jesus came, he came to show us how to treat each other and how to live, how to walk. He says, I've given you an example that you should do as I have done. So he lived as a man. He went through the same experiences we go through. And don't forget this. Jesus never used his own miraculous power for selfish purposes. He always used it to heal, to feed, to save others. Okay? He struggled with thirst just like you and I. He got tired and fell asleep in a boat. He lived among men. He showed us how to forgive and to love those who mistreat us. So as our example, third reason Jesus came is our, as our substitute. He took what we deserve and he offers us what he deserves. He takes our weakness and he gives us his strength. He takes our sin and he gives us his purity. He made this incredible transition with us. He traded places with us, our substitute. Those are the three reasons. Now, he is called the Word. The Word was made flesh. If I say right now, I want you to picture Jesus in your mind. You all have a little mental screen in your head. What do you picture? Well, it depends on where you're from and who you are, but a lot of people picture, you know, you've got somebody with hazel eyes and chestnut hair, six feet tall, always good looking. <laughs> what color is his robe? White robe. Okay, where does it say he wore a white robe anywhere in the Bible? Doesn't say it. Says he had a nice robe, never says what color it was. We get these concepts from paintings. You know, we don't know what Jesus looked like. There was no videotape, no photograph back then. He changed the world by virtue of 
His word, what he said. Amen. Jesus was the word of God incarnate. And that's why when people say, oh boy, you know, I wish I could see Jesus, if I could walk with Jesus, you've got the most important thing about what came to earth right here. The word of God became flesh. Christ is recorded in these pages. He is the word that became flesh. Okay, let's move along now to our next question. Four, what kind of people did God use to write the Bible? Answer, say it with me. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Some people say, well, you know, how can we trust that the Bible is not just made up? How do we know these folks didn't have too much lobster for dinner and then just have wild dreams and write it all down? Well, the Bible tells us these were people who had consecrated their lives to God. It was holy men and women. You know, there's the prayers of different women in the Bible recorded as well. The Bible not only was written by holy men, but the Bible makes holy men and holy women. It's like Dwight Moody used to say, either sin will keep you from the Bible or the Bible will keep you from sin. The reason this is called Santa Biblia, Holy Bible, it's a sacred book written by holy men. There have been attempts made through the ages to extinguish the scriptures and they failed. The Bible is an anvil that has worn out many hammers. Number five, eternal life comes from knowing Jesus. How was Jesus known to his disciples on the road to Emmaus, the experience that we just read? You remember? It says that he was known as he broke bread, in the breaking of bread. Now, one of the phrases that's often used in the scripture for the Bible is, this is the bread of life. Some of you have heard that hymn, Break thou the bread of life, O Lord, unto me. Jesus said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. See, bread was the most basic form of nourishment in Bible time that gave people strength and life. And sometimes there were serious famines and people hungered for bread. And God says, man does not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. When the children of Israel went through the wilderness, this miraculous angel food rained down called manna, and the people had to go out and gather it. God provided the bread, but they had to go get it. And it's amazing to me that there are Bibles in virtually every hotel room in uh, North America, and we are living in a country where people are so biblically illiterate. There's still a lot of uh, people out there think the epistles are the wives of the apostles. <laughs> You'd be amazed at some of the things that uh, they've tested these children about their Bible knowledge. And one young man said, the question was, what happened, or who was Lot's wife? He said, Lot's wife was a pillar of salt by day and a ball of fire at night. <laughs> and, <laughs> who was Noah's wife? Joan of Arc, of course. <laughs> a lot of biblical ignorance in the world because we've got all these Bibles, but people don't use them. They don't read them. It's like the little girl who was helping her mother dust the coffee table, and there was this big family Bible that had been there all along. She took a hard look at it for the first time and said, Mama, whose book is this? She said, honey, that's God's book. Don't you think it's time we gave it back to him? No one here reads it. <laughs> people have them by their headboards or by the nightstands. It's sort of like a good luck charm. Some people keep their, their Bibles. It's like a family heirloom. You know, they press leaves and they've got the, the marriage registry in it. And it's sort of like, it's like a relic in the family, the Bible. And I uh, heard about one boy, he was flipping through the family Bible and he found a leaf, like a maple leaf that had been pressed in there by his mother at a funeral. People use their Bibles at weddings and funerals, you know. And uh, he said, Mama, what's this in the Bible I found? She said, I don't know, what are you looking at? She says, I, the boy said, I think I found Adam's suit. <laughs> You've got to read it for it to do you any good. We need to go out and gather the word if the Bible is going to be of benefit to us. And so we need to utilize the word and read it on our own. It's the bread of life that uh, gives us hope. Now, remember what I said? Eternal life comes from knowing the Lord. John 17, verse 1 through 3, you read that. How was Jesus known? In the breaking of bread. You know, sometimes you might be thinking, I don't understand the Bible. It's, it's complicated. How many of you remember the story where the disciples brought their bread to Jesus? They only had five loaves and a couple of fish. They gave it to Jesus. He blessed it. He broke it. He gave it back to them, and it multiplied in their hands. 
That's what will happen for you if you take it to the Lord. When you open your Bible, ask Him to guide you in your study. Question number six. How important should Bible study be to the Christian? Job chapter 23, verse 12. I have esteemed the words of his mouth, what's the answer? More than my necessary food. Now, if you've got to hasten out the door and you've got a choice between your Bible reading and your raisin bran, fiber is very important, but it's not going to save your soul when temptation comes later in the day. We need to take advantage of the Word of God that He's made available. Psalms 119, 105. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's Word will guide you in the direction that you need to go. It will give you purpose in life. Question number seven. Who helps us understand the Bible? John 16, verse 13. When He, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. So who do we need to understand the Bible? The Holy Spirit will guide us. That's the same as John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, He shall teach you all things. And then we have one more in this answer. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. We speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. The Holy Spirit will teach you. Now, will the Holy Spirit ever teach anything contrary to the Word of God? I've run into people before and they say, well, Doug, I know that you go by the Bible. That's the old letter. It's dead. That's old. I go by the Spirit. It's fresh. It's new. And they say that if the Spirit of God tells you something and it's conflicting with the Word of God says, you need to go with the Spirit. Oh, that's very dangerous because you could be led by all kinds of different things you call the Spirit. A lot of people say they're spirit-led, and they're really just being led by their own inclination. And the Bible tells us, Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance the things that I have said. The Holy Spirit is not going to conflict with the Word of God. Amen. They will be united. They are one, okay? So don't fall for that very popular deception that the Spirit's going to teach something contrary or are diametrically opposed to the Word of God. There's a perfect unity there. Pray for God's Spirit as you study His Word. Next question should be number eight. What must I do to be certain the Holy Spirit is guiding me in my Bible study? Not only should we pray for the Spirit, Luke 11 verse 9 tells us, And I say unto you, ask, pray, ask, and it shall be given unto you. Furthermore, we read in Luke chapter 11 verse 13, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? You know, a lot of people say, I don't understand the Bible, and they just walk away from it. Did you really hunger and thirst? You know, I, I've written several books, not just my testimony, and people often ask me to autograph my book. I usually scribble my name where it's not legible. And then I put my favorite scripture, Jeremiah 29, 13. It says, you will search for me, and you'll find me. When you search for me, who knows the rest of that? With all of your heart. Amen. You need to make an investment in knowing God. And I'll tell you, friends, if anything's important, knowing God and knowing the purpose of life, that's important. Amen? Amen. You know, I'm persuaded a person cannot be happy unless they understand three basic truths. We need to know something about where we've come from. We need to know something about what we're doing here and where we're going. That's why prophecy in the Bible is so essential, is because people cannot be secure. I know, I grew up basically an atheist, and I was miserable because I didn't know where I came from. I was hearing all kinds of things, and I didn't know what I was doing here, and I had no idea where I was going, and I knew I was only here for a little while, and I had no idea why. A lot of unhappy people out there because they don't understand those three basic essentials. The Bible will give you all of those answers. That will give you a peace that passes understanding. It's worth praying for. It's worth searching for. Amen. All right. Number John 17. Got a third part of this uh, answer here. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine whether it be of God. So we need to ask we need to be willing to do. Some people don't understand because they have no intention of doing what God wants them to do. One of the hardest things that Jesus wrestled with during his earthly life was in the Garden of Gethsemane 
where he prayed to the point where he was perspiring with blood mixed in his perspiration. And you know what he said in that prayer? If it's possible, Lord, that this cup, this separation from you, this sacrifice, if there's any other way, let it pass. But if not, not my will, your will be done. The key to happiness and victory is for each of us to say, Lord, I am willing to do your will. Before the seminar is over, we'll teach you a little chorus that talks about being willing to do God's will. Number nine, how does prayerful study of the Word help us? Psalm 119, verse 11, Thy word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin. I've told you that the Word of God will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Word of God. There is a degree of conviction. When you read the Bible, it might point out something in your life that's not healthy, that might make you uncomfortable, but if you cooperate with God, you'll, you'll have peace. So the Word keeps you from sin or sin keeps you from the Word. Friends, if you knew that there was a red button, little secret weapon red button that you had to press once a day, and you knew if you pressed that button, you were going to live forever in paradise. Would you make every effort to press that button once a day? Would you? Yes. Friends at home, would you make that effort? Yes. Want me to tell you what that secret weapon is? Now, I don't believe we're saved by works. I believe that we are saved by faith. But you know where faith comes from? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans yes. tells us, okay? That secret button is a relationship with the Lord from a personal devotion life knowing how to read the Bible and getting to know God through it. Not only that, you'll understand the prophecies. We need to put on the whole armor of God. And what was the, one of the most important parts of that armor? It says, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We do battle with the devil every day. And a lot of people are easily overcome. The only offensive weapon in the armor of God that you find there in Ephesians chapter 6 is the sword. What did Jesus use when the devil came to tempt him in the wilderness? I'm talking to some of you that know that story. Three times the devil tried to tempt Christ, and all three times, what did Christ say? It is written, it is written, it is written. Quoted the Bible all three times, and you know he quoted all three times from the book of Deuteronomy. And so if the Old Testament was good enough for Jesus, then it's good enough for me too. What do you say? Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things. If you call, does he, does God lie? He said, call and I will answer you. Ask, you will receive. And not only that, I will show you great and mighty things. God will give you profound, brilliant revelations that will explode in your mind with new light that will just daze you with the, the, the things that he wants to share with you. Now I want to move on to uh, Romans chapter 15, verse 4. And it says, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we might have hope. God wants us to be educated. He wants us to know what's going on. He wants us to have hope. You know, the Bible tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The Bible will increase your intelligence, not diminish from it. James 1.5, wisest man who ever lived was Solomon, and he began his reign endorsing the Word of God. The Bible tells us if we lack wisdom, if any of you lack what? Wisdom, let him ask of God and it shall be given him. Now, I believe what God says. Do you? He says, ask me, I'll give you wisdom. This is how we must approach the prophecies if we're going to understand them. Question number 10. What method of Bible study do the scriptures recommend? Now, we've talked about you need to pray, you need to make sure the Spirit is guiding you, you need to be willing to do His will. Isaiah 28, verse 10, for precept must be upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. 1 Corinthians 2, 13, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. Now, I'm a pilot. I fly an airplane. I've got this tool. I told you my dad's in the aviation industry used to own two airlines. And so he said, Doug, if you want to get your license, I'll subsidize it. Let me say something for the record. I failed to mention last night, my father, bless his heart, very wealthy man, but he never gives anything. He does not believe in God the way I do. He's never given a penny to Amazing Facts or to my church. I get a pastor's salary. I want to make that clear, because <laughs> sometimes people misunderstand. 
But he did pay for my flying lessons, and I'm very grateful. And I've got a pilot's license, and I've got this little tool called a GPS in my airplane that is a real lifesaver. They're relatively new. Uh, just in the last few years, they've become very popular. It's called a global positioning system. I know where I am at any given moment. It's wonderful as I fly along. But when I first get in my airplane and start flying, when I first turn it on, it doesn't help me. It'll give me a little message. It'll say, one satellite, not sufficient information to give you your location. Then I wait a little bit and it continues to search. Pretty soon the screen says, two satellites, need three. Then pretty soon it'll pop on the screen my location on the map. With three satellites, it can find out where I am. Then it gets four, five, seven. I've had, you know, eight or nine satellites, and it'll tell me where I am within six feet on a runway, tells me what my elevation is, it tells me how long until I get to my destination, because the more satellites it tunes into, it is able to tighten up its coordination so it can pinpoint your position. When you study the Bible, it's important to compare Scripture with Scripture. Some people read one scripture and they build a whole church, a whole denomination on one scripture and they get these kooky eccentric doctrines because they're not using a multitude of scriptures and laying a good foundation. Jesus said, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let something be established. Now I'd like to have a volunteer from the audience. You in the blue shirt. Will you come up here? Hurry up real quick. Don't, don't, don't be embarrassed. I'm not going to embarrass you very much. <laughs> Come up on stage here. I wanted to pick somebody that looked robust and uh, at least bigger than me. And what's your name? Chad Bernard. Chad, thank you so much. I appreciate your coming up here. You want to wave to anybody you know around the world? Okay. Now, Chad, <laughs> I weigh about 160 pounds when I'm wet. I want you to spread your feet apart a little bit. I'm going to try and push you off balance with one hand. Don't let me do it. Okay? okay? No! Ben, okay, boy. You know, sometimes I don't really try. Okay, uh, now I want you to lift one foot. Which one? Either one, doesn't matter much to me. Just stand on one foot. Keep it up, though. Keep right. it up. Okay, one thumb. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chad. Appreciate your help. Do you get the point? You need one nail, and you can spin a two by four in any direction. You need to nail it down. And so what we're doing in this seminar is we're not going to try and get you to believe the conclusion of some prophecy on some ambiguous, nebulous scripture out there. We're going to give you lots of evidence for your conclusions. That's why we're inviting you to ask questions so that we can come to accurate conclusions. Do you think it's God's will that there's this much confusion and diversity in the name of the Bible and God? That there's so much division? No, so much of it comes from people just taking one passage or one scripture and building on the sand. We need to compare Scripture with Scripture. The next one says, 2 Peter 1.20, No prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, sometimes I've been at Bible studies where someone says, Well, I know what this Scripture says to you, but to me, I think this Scripture says, Oh, come on, God is not that way. Truth is absolute. Amen. People say, Well, this is your truth, and this is my truth, and we're living in this world where everything is relative. That's very dangerous, friends. That's not how God operates. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is an absolute truth, and you know what's more? If you seek for it, you will find it. There's a promise, but you need to search. Are you aware that nowhere in the Bible are we told to read the Bible? But it does say in the Bible, search the Bible, study the Scriptures. It's not a novel. It's not something you go through once and say, that was interesting. It's on a continual basis we mine into the depths of the Word of God. I know a man who would read it through about six times a year, and he lived into his 90s, and he got new things out of it every time. Martin Luther said you should read the Bible something like the way you pick apples. He said, first you go to the trunk and shake the whole tree. So then you go and you shake the branches. Then you get out on the limbs and you shake the limbs. And then pretty soon you're looking behind the leaves and the twigs. Get the overview. Read the whole book. And then you could start breaking it down and looking at some of the other particulars. Number 11, what will studying the Scriptures do for us? 2 Timothy 3.15, Thou hast known the Holy Scriptures that are able to make you wise unto salvation. 
which is through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. The scriptures will give you wisdom, and the scriptures are the medium through which God gives us the information that can save us for eternity. I think that's good news. Number 12, according to Jesus, where do we find the truth? What's the answer there? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Where is the truth about Jesus revealed the most clearly? It's in the Word of God. And then John 17, verse 7, Thy word is truth. Now, some people have often thought, well, you know, Doug, the Bible's an old book, and we know that it's been copied and copied and copied, and if we did an experiment tonight, where if I went down here on the corner of the audience and I whispered something in the ear of a gentleman sitting there and I said, look, I want you to pass that little sentence down the row, whisper in the ear of everybody here, and we'll go up to the balcony and back down to the floor. And then I come over to the person over here and I say, what was the message that I originally delivered to the person over here after going through a thousand people to this person here? How many of you think that it's going to be changed by the time I get it? We all agree. People say, well, you know, obviously the Bible is such an old book, it's been changed and we don't know what it really said originally. Not so. I used to use that same argument when I was an atheist. Back in 1947, down at the lowest point on the earth by the Dead Sea, 1,300 feet below sea, uh, sea level, a Bedouin shepherd boy was looking for some missing goats. He noticed these caves that were not very far. It's by a town called Qumran, not very far from a main highway. It had been there for 2,000 years took a rock and threw it up in the cave, wondering if his goats had wandered in there or just doing what boys do. And he heard a clattering, breaking sound that did not sound like rock. He scampered up into the cave, and inside that cave, he found all of these ancient clay pots that had these leather scrolls. Inside were parts of the Bible. They discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. Because of the dry climate, they had been preserved almost perfectly for over 2,000 years, some of them. Every part of the Old Testament, except the book of Esther, in part or in whole, was found. Now, while I was there in Jerusalem, I went to a museum. It's called the Shrine of the Book. And some of their most sacred writings are there. The Dead Sea Scrolls are there. They've got metal detectors and bomb-sniffing dogs because here they've got the oldest copies of their sacred writings. I took my guide, who spoke and read Hebrew fluently. I never did very well when I went to synagogue. I never learned to read backwards, you know. And I took him over and I said, uh, can you read this? He said, well, you know, it's old Hebrew, but I've been trained and I studied it. I said, translate that for me. I told you I know my Bible pretty well. So he found a place on the Isaiah scroll and he began to read and translate just from top of his head as well as he could into English. And I got goosebumps all over my body because he began to recite to me the story of where Sennacherib brought his army against Hezekiah and the Rabshakeh, the butler, began to mock the God of Israel. And it was word for word, even through his oral translation, the way it appears in my Bible today. Amen. God did something incredible, something supernatural to preserve that book. You know, when the ancient scribes were commanded to write the Bible, if they made a mistake, they tore up the whole, the whole volume, and they did it by hand back then. First book ever printed on a printing press. What was it? It was the Bible. It is the, books of, the book of books, and you can trust that it is still dependable today. What do you say? Amen. I believe you can trust it. Archaeology continues to support the fact that the Bible is dependable. It's the most, now it's the most respected, it didn't always be that way, but the more research, the more digging they've done, the more they've come to find that the Bible continues to be the source book for ancient history, and it is very dependable. The things that they still have not proven, I trust, will be proven. So you can count on that. Number 13, what warnings regarding Bible study are given in the Scripture? The Bible tells us that there's some warnings that we need to appreciate. First of all, study. Remember I said the Bible doesn't say read it. Study to show yourself approved unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth. There's a right way and there's a wrong way. Some people take one scripture and tear it out of its context and attach it to another scripture. It's like there's a scripture that, somewhere that says Judas went out and hung himself. Then you could take that scripture where Jesus says, go thou and do likewise. You can put those two together and commit suicide. And so you've got to be careful to not twist it. You've got to read it in its context and allow the Bible to speak for itself. 
Next uh, scripture tells us, in all of his epistles, Peter here is referring to Paul, there are some things that are hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, that means twist, as they do the other scriptures. Now, I don't want to rush past this. Peter is telling us that there are some things that are hard to understand. Peter is calling the writings of Paul scripture. And Paul was a New Testament writer. So the, the majority of the writings in the New Testament, other than the Gospels, are the writings of Paul. Does Peter tell us that Paul is scripture? That's what he's saying. But he says some of it's hard to be understood. They that are unstable rest them to their own destruction. It's a very dangerous thing when that happens. And uh, our next question is number 14. How shall we test all the religious teachings and doctrines of the Bible? How do we know what we're reading, if it's dependable, if it's true? It tells us about these Berean believers that came to an understanding of the truth and it just fell on them spontaneously. Is that what happened? Some people think they're going to have an experience with God that's going to just kind of drop on them like pink mashed potatoes one day and they're going to be enlightened. If you want to be enlightened, you need to search, you need to knock, you need to ask. It says they received the word with all readiness of mind and they searched the scriptures daily. You know, in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. It's not just talking about the bread that you eat. It's saying, give us our spiritual food, the bread of life, Jesus, on a daily basis that we might be nourished spiritually. They searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So we need to do it for ourselves. You know, uh, Yellowstone Park, never been there. But I understand that, of course, they've got uh, all these bears that roam free. As soon as you get inside the park, you'll see signs everywhere that say, Please do not feed the bears. And yet, everywhere you look, the tourists are rolling down their windows. They can't resist, and they're tossing cookies and donuts and candy to the bears, and the bears are so cute, and they, you know, they want to get pictures, so they feed the bears. And one of the tourists went up to the park ranger, and he said, you've got signs everywhere that says, please don't feed the bears, and everywhere people are feeding the bears. He said, why do you just get rid of the signs? And the ranger said, you know, if these people only saw what we saw, when the first winter chill comes and it begins to freeze, we have to go around with a backhoe and a bucket and pick up the starved, frozen bodies of the bears because they did not learn to feed themselves. They got so used to all the little treats and delicacies that were thrown to them. You know, we live in a very religious country here in North America, but I think we have a problem. We depend on the priest and the rabbi and the pastor, and I'm including myself, I'm a pastor, to give us some dessert once a week, and we don't know how to feed ourselves. We want to be spoon-fed a little bit. We want to be entertained by the minister, but we've not learned to feed ourselves. And when the storm comes, and you know the Bible tells us there's a storm coming. Jesus said the wise man builds on the rock, and when the storm comes, his house stands. What's the rock? He that hears these words of mine and does them. The fool builds on the sand, and when the storm comes, his house disintegrates. You notice something? The storm comes to the wise man, and the storm comes to the fool. The difference is, are we building on the rock? Are we listening to the Word of God? We must know the Word of God for ourselves. Amen. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20 tells us, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is a little bit, there is no light in them. All religions have different elements of light, but God wants us to know, does it measure with the Scriptures? the Law and the Prophets, the Word of God. That's the only way to be sure. Number 15. What happened when Jesus explained the Scriptures to His two discouraged disciples on the road to Emmaus? How did they respond? Luke 24, verse 32. They said, Did not our hearts burn within us while He talked with us by the way and while He opened to us the Scriptures? I am praying and pleading with God. I have been for a year now that those that attend this program will not be hearing me. I want them to hear the Lord speaking through His Word. Amen. That's why we're putting the Bibles in your hands and lessons to help you find your way through the Bible and to navigate around in the Scripture because you will feel that heavenly heartburn as you study the Word of God that will give you hope and purpose. You'll understand where you've come from, what you're doing here, and where you're going as you proceed. Number 16. 
after these two disciples knew that Jesus was alive and heard him explain the prophecies, what did they do? Oh, they just, they had spunk in their trunk and pep in their step and zip in their hip and a little fanatic in the attic too. They couldn't sit still. They were so excited, even though it was now dark and they were tired and they were hungry, they said, we've got to tell our friends they're discouraged, they're despondent up in the city, and they charged back uphill in the dark, stumbling over the rocks to give the good news at that Jerusalem, that Jesus was alive. They now wanted to share what Christ had shared with them in opening the scriptures. You see what happens, friend? Jesus opened the scriptures to two disciples. He said, now you go pass it on. The disciples brought Jesus their bread. He broke the bread. He gave it to them. He said, now you give it to the multitude. This is how the Lord operates. He gives it to us for what purpose? So that we can just gorge ourselves or he wants us to then share it with others. Friends, the best way to keep the Word of God alive and vital in your life is you need to pass it on. You'll not run out as you do this. It will continue to multiply in your own heart. You know, friends, we're giving you the keys to unlock prophecy. And before I finish with the lesson here, there's something very important I want you to take note of. The back of your lesson, did you see that there's a key that has a number of Bible symbols these are symbols, and it gives the scripture so you can know for yourself. Tonight was a very important foundation we were building on the rock. If you're going to understand the prophecies, you need to understand where do we go. In these different symbols, you will find the keys to un unlocking prophecy. But I need to be honest with you. If you came to the seminar and you're thinking, uh, Doug, stay away from the stuff about Jesus and don't get too religious. I just want to know the future. I just want to know about the beast and the mark of the beast and the second coming and Armageddon. I want to know these things, but don't talk about Jesus. Sorry, friends, I can't detach Jesus from Revelation and from Daniel. It is a revelation of Jesus and the whole purpose of the Word of God. Indeed, He is the Word of God. And so the two are interwoven in a way that cannot be separated. And so I'm hoping that the final result of your coming to this seminar is you are building a foundation that you will be trusting in Jesus. I'd like to invite John to come. And Kelly, we thank you for being at the piano each night. I have an important story to share with you in just a moment. But John's going to sing about trusting in Jesus and the confidence and the faith that believe, it that will bring into your heart. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know the saith the Lord Jesus Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and over. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him.
A little more than a hundred years ago, a man was uh, struggling financially. His aunt died, left her estate, but by the time he paid all the expenses and paid off the bills, uh, that quickly evaporated. And she left in her will that she was bequeathing her Bible and all the treasure it contained. Well, 35 years went by. He set that Bible up on the mantle in his house, never opened it once. Then in his old age, poverty-stricken, lost everything, packed up to go move in with his son. And in packing, he picked up that Bible that had been sitting there staring at him for 35 years and began to thumb through it for the first time. His aunt has, had left him that Bible. Inside, he found $5,000 between its pages. By today's standards, it would be $50,000, just to give you the context. He had all those resources all that time he had failed to appreciate, he'd failed to enjoy because he never opened the book. There are a lot of people who are missing out on a treasure that God has in store for them simply because they don't take advantage of the book that has come down to us at such a great expense. Friends, there's a danger that familiarity breeds contempt. We have so many Bibles. Some people have five in their house, and yet there's so much biblical ignorance. I am pleading with you, yearning, that you will take advantage to acquaint yourself with Him and be at peace. He will reveal Himself with you. You will be known, or He will be known to you in the breaking of bread. And so how many of you are willing to say, by God's grace, I am going to look once again in that blessed book and get to know Him? Is that your plan? Amen. Praise the Lord. Then I'd invite you to bow your heads with me as we close this part of our meeting with prayer. Loving Lord, we want to thank you for your presence here tonight, what you have done, and what we trust you will do. We want to thank you even now for the experience of feeling that heavenly heartburn that comes as you break the bread of life in our midst. Lord, I pray that we will long for a better knowledge of Christ that comes through the living word. Please bless each of these people, the ones who are watching in the churches, in their homes, the ones who are watching in different parts of the world. I pray that we will come to acquaint ourselves with the prophecies and with the stories in the Bible that will unlock the storehouse of treasure that you have for each one of us. Please be with us now, Lord, and I pray that you'll not allow the devil to do anything to keep us from coming back, that we might know you and everlasting life. And it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now, friends, do not forget that on your way out, you're going to get another study guide. The next lesson is dealing with the coming king. How many of you have wanted to know something about the second coming of Jesus? This lesson, we're getting right into the heart of it. We're going to take prophecies that deal with the second coming of the Lord. We're not going to set a day or the hour, but we're going to help you understand how he's coming, which is very, very important for us to comprehend. We're also going to help you understand some of the details of how soon he's coming according to the prophecies. We'll see you at our next meeting.